Hey, I should say, in the normal course of events, uh, I wouldn't think of uh, Sally and Douglas as European. And it's interesting to me that uh, pe people, I'm glad you don't, people always used to distinguish uh, 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 about that. You, you used to talk to people in New York and they'd say, I got a, I got a uh, plane to catch a JFK tonight, I'm flying to Heathrow and then I'm going on to Europe. And Europe was something separate from Britain. And that's an important, that's a very important distinction. There was a terrible British sitcom I remember seeing years ago. It was one of these sort of boy meets girl thing and they spent like six years no, not quite kind of, uh, you know, consummating the relationship. It went on for years, a terrible show. And the, the, um, and at one point she says, because they kept needing plot twists as to why they could never get together. So at one point she says to him, oh, I've taken a job in the European community. And he says to her, you're going to work in Europe, and she says patiently, whatever the guy's name was, Paul, Britain is in Europe. So he goes, so you're saying you're getting a job in Britain? And she says, no, I'm getting a job in Europe. And, 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 the, and the whole point was that Britain was separate from Europe. And it is interesting to me, you have a panel, uh, except for this rebel colonist here, that is all children of the British Empire. Uh, and, uh, and, and if Britain was confident about its contribution to the world, it would not be thinking of itself as European in that sense. It would understand that it had made a broader contribution to the world, that every corner of the world, not only the dominant hyperpower of the planet, but also the dominant regional powers, whether you're talking about South Africa or India or Australia, uh, are all descended from this one nothing miserable, gray, dingy, rainy little island uh, in the North Sea off the coast of Europe. And so it is a measure of the corrosion that multiculturalism and cultural relativism causes uh, that, that uh, Douglas and Sally should be presumed to be European. I, I don't think of them so, I don't think of them as that. Um, now, but but to, to address multiculturalism more broadly, I mean, I find, what I find fascinating is you take traditionalisms, uh, fascism, Nazism, communism. They are almost by definition isms designed to provoke an argument. Uh, some guy comes up and says, uh, I'm a fascist. And you say, oh yeah, well I'm a communist. They're designed to be oppositional. Uh, multiculturalism is the slipperiest ism because it, it, uh, it doesn't invite an argument. It says there's no point to having an argument. Uh, you know, it says basically, <laughs> if everything is of equal value, what the hell is the point of talking about any of it? And that is what makes it such an elusive enemy uh, to get a, a hold on. Now, almost every Western country has signed up to full-blown uh, multiculturalism. Uh, and I say just every Western country because the interesting thing about multiculturalism is it's a unicultural phenomenon. You can't, you can't be multicultural in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's, it's, it's impossible. Uh, and, and so if the purpose of your culture is to celebrate multiculture, uh, you're in effect saying that our bedrock belief is that we believe in everything, which is the same thing as saying we believe in, in nothing. Uh, you, you know, our core value is that we have no core values. And that is what they teach in, in schools these days. I think multiculturalism uh, is two things. It's a cult of ignorance. Uh, I, said, I said we were all, uh, except for this rebel colonist here, we were all children of the British Empire. And I'm, I'm old enough to have been taught by old teachers who taught, uh, who went back to the days uh, when there was a big map in the classroom and the bits in it that were colored red to mark the British Empire. It was, you know, that was the ultimate red state, not like the ones here. That was one serious red state. And, uh, and uh, these guys had and spent a couple of years out in obscure uh, islands teaching the nation natives about Shakespeare and the glories of Rome and all the rest of it. And they were very clear. They were tremendously multicultural in the sense that they knew tons and tons about other cultures. They knew phenomenal things about obscure tribes that nobody else was ever going to hear about. They could speak all kinds of obscure languages that nobody uh, is, is ever going to speak. Uh, and yet, the fact of the matter is, they knew all about these other cultures, but they knew which culture was objectively superior to that. Now you don't need to know anything about other cultures. The great thing about multiculturalism is it, it, it absolves you of knowing anything. You go to people who believe in multiculturalism and say, uh, well, uh, what are the, uh, what are the uh, principal exports of Nepal? They can't tell you. 
They can't tell you. You say, uh, what is the capital? I had this a couple of days after September 11th. I uh, went to Dartmouth College. I had to look something up in the library there. And outside the library, there's a demonstration saying, you know, um, uh, war is never the answer, one of these things. And these guys were standing around. Elites, people mortgage their houses to send their kids to this place. <laughs> they, uh, they go, uh, you know, they go, oh, this war's a terrible thing. They go, well, what you must remember, you've got to address the root causes. And I go, oh, yeah, what's that? And they go, well, uh, poverty breeds a resentment, breeds desperation, desperation breeds hostility, hostility breeds terror. I said, oh, yeah, what's the capital of Saudi Arabia? <laughs> nobody, nobody knows anything. Multi... <laughs> Multi multiculturalism is not about knowing anything about other cultures. It's just about feeling, uh, you know, warm and fluffy about them. And I'm sure Douglas, I'm sure every member on this panel has had this experience. You go on, you're giving some speech somewhere, you're on some uh, radio show, somebody calls in and uh, they, want, they say, well, I think you're being, I had this experience on NPR the other day, somebody called up and goes, well, I think you're being very hierarchical. I never even knew that was a pejorative word. Uh, <laughs> And this, uh, this guy, uh, I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? He said, well, you've just said most uh, Muslim countries aren't free. Uh, and I said, look, that is, that is a fact. I said, if you, take, uh, if you take, for example, countries that just have 20% of the population's Muslim, only three of them qualify as free, uh, Serbia and Montenegro, uh, Benin and Suriname and it will be interesting to see whether France will prosper as a fourth member of that group and uh, and the guy goes well what do you mean there isn't free uh, then they're not free and then I, so then you start reeling off objective statistics uh, about literacy about uh, GDP per capita uh, about uh, women's rights about uh, about uh, votes and democracy these are facts fact what we used to call before the multicultural age <laughs> facts so you reel off five facts and the guy goes, oh yeah, well that's just your opinion. I mean, uh, Robert Frost, Robert, you know, Robert, Robert Frost famously said of free verse that it was like playing uh, tennis with the net down. And, and, the, and, and the trouble with uh, having a, dis tr trouble with, dis you can't, uh, d discussing cultural relativism with cultural relativists is like playing tennis with some guy who says, your ace is just a social construct. Uh, <laughs> You, you can't, so that is why it is really the most elusive thing uh, that we have to deal with in, in, in our society. It's all but impossible uh, simply because it's a denial of reality. Yes, it was.